Hello, and welcome to this episode of Lift Every Voice. Lift Every Voice is a program of the Louisville Branch NAACP in which we seek to keep our community informed of the issues that are facing our community and bring to your attention items on which you should make a focus and begin to do things. We're, as you well know, the NAACP has been fighting for civil rights since 1906 and continue even to this day. And our efforts are always constant. We're always in battle, always at war, but always seeking to make the most of all the opportunities to make available more opportunities to African-Americans. You know, today we have a very special guest in which we will talk about the Kentucky Civil Rights Act. Many people in our community do not know that Kentucky has a Civil Rights Act. It's been here since 1966. Many people in our community do not know how to uh, impact or to use to their advantage the Civil Rights Act. And the enforcement of that of the Civil Rights Act in Kentucky falls to the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights. And today I'm privileged to have with me the executive director of the Kentucky Commission, Mr. Terrence Sullivan. Terrence, welcome. Well, uh, thank you for having me. Well, Terrence, I, I, I'm going to jump right into it because I want to have a, a, an on-flowing conversation with you. You know, the, the give us some history on on the founding or at least the the. Uh, beginning of the Kentucky Civil Rights Act, which goes all the way back to 1966. Sure, so the commission itself um, was started in 1960. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 1964, kind of got a little bit of authority, mm -hmm. but we didn't really have much that we could do. Um, up until 1966, the commission was just there to encourage people to treat others fairly. Um, but in 1966, with the passage of the Kentucky Civil Rights Act um, to model the federal level um, act, we then got, I like to say, got our teeth mm -hmm. because then the office was able to then, I'll use the word prosecute, mm -hmm. but hear and decide um, cases of discrimination in employment, housing, public accommodations, and financial transactions. So, you know, I mean, many people don't realize that Kentucky was, I think, the first state in the South to, in fact, adopt the Civil Rights Act. We were the first state, uh, we were the first Southern state to adopt a, a Civil Rights Act to model the federal uh, version and also the first to open a, an official um, commission to enforce those laws, which was something that was really, uh, I like to show this at the office, but it was a big thing to Dr. Martin Luther King, who helped uh, get that started through the March on Frankfurt. Okay. So let's just talk about what, what all the, the, Civil, the Civil Rights Act covered. Let's do talk about the specifics and, 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 and get into a little bit more detail on each of those areas. So let's, let's start with, with uh, you know, in terms of em employment. Sure. So employment is, our, is the biggest issue um, at the commission. It's what the bulk, I think 78% of our cases are in employment. Um, and that covers any retaliatory action or discriminatory action in the workplace. So if you had an employer who was maybe, they fired you because you were a member of a protected class, um, or you reported that you were feeling discriminated against, and then they then maybe cut your hours or did something to you where you had a negative action in the workplace, then you're able to file with the commission and say, okay, this happened to me in the workplace due to me being a member of a protected class, which could be age, race. Right. I was going to ask yeah. you to expound, on, <laughs> expound on, on protected class so that people, that our, uh, our viewers will, will understand better what's it. So we something. have, we have age, race, sex, um, most recently, that has also included sexual orientation um, and identity, um, pregnancy, and disability, which is until a few years ago was our largest one, was if the big piece of that is if your employer fails to accommodate uh, a disability accommodation request that you make. Um, we've had a bunch recently about stools for pregnant workers. Okay. Um, I don't understand how that in the past month, we've had quite a few um, <laughs> different places, but all pregnant people that requested a still one didn't get one. Um, but mm -hmm. those types of things in the workplace. And I, like I said, that's our biggest one that we have. So that's employment. So let this go from there to uh, public accommodations. 
Sure. And one strange thing about employment is Kentucky is one of the only states that also has smoking status as a protected class <laughs> in employment. So I'm not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> so very Kentucky of us. Um, but in public accommodations, this one, it's what most people think of, but it's one of the hardest to move forward because we, in, this is a good time to talk about that. Um, for public accommodations, that's if you were to go to a store and they didn't let you come in or didn't let you do anything there because of your, again, membership of a protected class, or they deny you a service or the enjoyment of whatever service they provide. And so then you could then file a complaint against that, whatever that place is. Um, unfortunately, we cannot in this state um, extend some of the the orientation or identity pieces to public accommodations, but for all the other protected classes, except for smoking status, those also um, remain the same. Those are the most difficult because in order to further a claim, we need to have witnesses to interview. Right. And it's very infrequent that you go to a store <laughs> and they do something discriminatory and then you get everyone's name who's in the store at the time who can vouch for it um, or you're able to get back to okay who was working on this day at this time so it's a if somebody has an issue in something like that i would say the best thing would be to report it immediately and where your memory is pretty good and where people there um, where their memory is a little bit more fresh because sometimes we'll have them after eight or nine months and then they don't remember even which store of the stores they went to or who was there who went with them and so it is very important to be really quick on those okay now talk about housing who housing mm -hmm. um housing is all of those same protected classes but it's really if you have some type of issue where it could be most people try to come to us for evictions mm -hmm. um unless it's an eviction based on membership of a protected class there's not much we can do we can refer you to others who can but the civil rights act does protect against discrimination in housing actually the fair housing act which was passed um two years later um covers that um for any type of negative action in your housing or that's also where some of those failures to accommodate similar to um, employment but failure to maybe make a premises that is accommodating for someone with a disability. Um, generally, that's federally owned properties, um, issues with landlords retaliating against you for maybe you reported some issue and then it was maybe you were having an issue and it was, you know, they're only they're charging this type of resident more money and you point that out and then they stop fixing your heat right. um, so something like that so that's really where housing goes okay so i'm going to talk about the interview we talk, started off by saying that that kentucky adopted its own mini civil rights act uh there's a civil rights act at, at the federal level uh which is enforced by the equal uh, eoc or equal employment opportunity commission so talk about the work of the kentucky commission and the work of the eoc and where there's overlap and, and how, how you cooperate sure um we are very thankful to the EEOC um, for helping us literally keep the lights on. Um, but what the EEOC does is they have enabled us or empowered us to investigate claims on their behalf and then they pay us for it, which is where the overlap comes in. Um, if someone were to file a complaint with us, we can then what's called dual file it with the EEOC where they create a case number for it and we work on their behalf and then they want to help us have the resources to ensure that we can complete it to satisfaction or to find a resolution. And so we are able to, we have work sharing agreements that we renew every year where we say we're going to make sure that we cover this many employment cases to make sure that we're and the, those numbers are based on the size of the state. So it's to make sure that we are 
working alongside the EEOC and protecting people in Kentucky. And similarly, you know, relationships with HUD as it relates to housing. So talk about that. Yes, we have a very similar, um, if not the same type of rela uh, relationship with HUD. Um, HUD does a little bit differently where we have, it's a lower number of cases that we dual file with them every year, um, but they also give us or work with us on training and outreach mm -hmm. and doing more to inform and educate the community about fair housing issues. And so on top of, and EEOC does this as well to some extent, but on top of helping pay for the resolution of cases and helping us process them through, they work with us every year, um, I just finished this two days ago, to identify um, training opportunities for people who work for the commission, but also they then help us identify funding to cover our own external training to people in the community about fair housing issues. So Terrence, I'm in Louisville and I feel like I have been discriminated. Let's talk about employment. I as an individual, who should I go to? Should I go to the commission or should I go to EEOC or should I just let it go? <laughs> well, you should definitely not let it go. Yeah, okay. Um, you could, uh, I would recommend you go to us first because yeah. if you go to us, it still gets filed with the EEOC, but you get the local commission, um, you get the easier to reach us mm -hmm. um, because we're not a large federal agency, it's just us. Um, but if you're in Louisville, you also have the, the option to go to our local commission as well, mm -hmm. the Human Relations Commission. Um, and that comes into play when there are, whatever the reason you were discriminated against in the workplace, if it's something that maybe isn't covered by the state law, but there's a local ordinance mm -hmm. that, uh, housing is a little bit more appropriate right now, but if there was a something in the local ordinance that made it more appropriate um, we could advise you to go to the local commission as well to file um, and they also would then have the option to file it with the eeoc as well so i guess with the with the the, the uh, i guess metro louisville uh, human rights commission it, it, what kind of collaboration that is done with them and with the kentucky commission so I honestly, I've been working on trying to improve that collaboration. <laughs> okay. um, right now, the way it works is we have some overlap, but we do make sure that we are referring ordinance, especially um, specific cases to Louisville Metro Human Relations, just because they are able to hear some things that we can't. Um, this is some examples. That, that's And this comes up mostly in housing, especially right now, because Louisville passed a new um, source of income as a protected class in housing. Um, we don't have that at the state level yet. And so if someone in Louisville were to say, this landlord wouldn't let me count my Section 8 voucher or child support or whatever as income for the um, income requirement for housing, um, they could file that. They could not file that with us yet. Um, hopefully that gets changed this year, but they could not file that with us just yet. So they could go through Metro Human Relations and file it based on the ordinance that was passed that expanded the protected classes to include source of income. You know, as, as I think as we as we, we think through that, tell tell us tell our viewers how that you init how the the initiation of the complaint process works and how the commission functions. Sure. Um, you can file a complaint multiple ways, mm -hmm. um, the easiest of which, which takes a little bit of access, but you can go online to kchr.ky.gov mm -hmm. and on every page now there's a big red button that says file a complaint mm -hmm. um, and you can start there. You can call um, our number 595-4024. Um, we also have an 800 number, which is 1-800-292-5566. And the, another way people can file, and this is even easier, is you can come down to the office on um, 4th and Broadway in the Habram building and go up to the 14th floor and we have a station where you can fill out your complaint um, and then 
one benefit of in-person is it shortens your timeline because complaints need to have some notarized signature on them. Um, and so if you fill it out, we then have a, right now for COVID, um, we have a way you can leave it and then someone can take it and we can review it and then they can talk through the screen or whatever and then it can be notarized and get that started. Um, the way the process works is once a complaint is initiated, so going back to your complaint that you filed against your employer, your former employer, um, we then take it um, within 20 days, uh, you're both given, you and your former employer have the option to elect to mediate. Um, once someone says no, let's assume you both say, someone says, if you say yes, mm -hmm. um, then we can pause the process, set up a meeting where you all come and talk through your differences and reach an agreement. If that fails, or if at any time any person says no, that case then gets assigned to an investigator. And the investigator takes it, reaches out to any of the involved parties, um, witnesses, reviews, internal policies to see if a policy was broken or if there was something that was not appropriate that happened. Um, they talk to both parties back and forth because up until there is a determination made, we're neutral. Yeah. We're in the middle, we're fact finding. Um, and so at the conclusion of the investigation, we then have the investigator present the, their findings to our legal unit and myself to make a determination of if there is probable cause to move forward. And what that means is that we have found that there's evidence that there was a violation of the Civil Rights Act. Um, so so if, if, if there's a finding that there's a violation, what, what role then does the commission then play? So the commission then switches to advocate. Okay. Um, at, at, we do those on Tuesdays at one. Mm -hmm. So if on Tuesday at 2.01, um, <laughs> we filed the paperwork to say that there was probable cause, then we are 100% on your side in your employment action. And we are your advocate. And we then file either in court or through an administrative hearing process to commence a hearing. Um, at any point you could settle, um, which does seem to happen once probable cause is determined. Right. Um, but you. At that point, we're moving forward to see that through. Right. And the commission, I uh, emphasize, does have legal jurisdiction to be able to have hearings and command uh, the attendance of parties and all of that as well. We are empowered uh, by Kentucky statute to be a quasi judicial body, which means that we can render decisions that have the full weight of the law which means that any of the party who's watching this, if they have an issue and don't think that the commission has any authority or power, they now know the commission does have that quasi judicial authority. We do. And if it doesn't exercise it itself, it can also go in court and, and get enforcement of what his findings are. That is correct. Okay. And we definitely um, want to make that aware, uh, let people know that we do have the authority to act on their behalf and help them. And so I am very hopeful that more people um, utilize us if they need it. Okay. You know, one of the things, Terrence, that, that I guess, you know, a lot of folks are concerned about, at least over the last maybe five or six years, and maybe even the last 20 years, in terms of enforcement of civil rights uh, in, the, in the country and mm -hmm. having said so much about in, enforcement in Kentucky. But what has the, you know, historically, I know you, you're, you know, you're now a little over a year into this role. I am. And you're doing an excellent <laughs> job, I should say is what has been the volume of complaints coming in in terms of, have you seen any <sighs> trends or anything that would indicate uh, that we're going through a, a, a different time or anything along those lines? So, and what I was alluding to earlier, um, we've had an increase in cases and employment is still by far our highest. Mm -hmm. And until a few years ago, most of the employment cases were disability related. Mm -hmm. Um, but we saw a shift a few years ago to where the bulk of them are race related. Okay. And what that says to me is that some, something has triggered a racial response that people might feel a little more empowered to be openly um, discriminatory or offensive. 
And that's created this influx of racial issues, not just in employment, but employment is the most noticeable because that's where we had this stark change from disability majority to disability has now moved to second. And so that's something that we've, we've seen. Um, we have quite a few new ones um, that are coming in now that are, uh, we've had a bunch of interesting COVID related okay. discrimination complaints coming in, um, be it mask requirements and saying that masks, yeah, those and vaccination requirements <laughs> are now coming in very quickly. But um, the biggest shift has just been that influx of racial issues. Okay. But, you know, I, I want to emphasize to, to people that, you know, what you hear today is that there there is a vehicle or a mechanism for people who feel compelled if they've been discriminated or to, in fact, move forward in terms of an organization that will d investigate their complaint, will follow through uh, in terms of trying to find a resolution. You know, as we th talk about where the Kentucky Commission is today, you know, we talked about going from 60 to 62 to 66 in terms of uh, the commission getting more teeth and ability to do things. As you sit where you sit today, where do you see the commission needing the, the greatest expansion of its authority and power or, or, or other areas? What do you see? Um, I think that's twofold. Mm -hmm. I think our biggest challenge um, that covers everything is resources. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely need more resources and with that we can do a lot more in terms of educating the community um, to prevent some issues but also educating the community of our existence. Um, I think that that's very important to let people know that we exist and that was my one of my charges when I started is I wanted to make sure that we up the profile a little and I think resources is necessary for that but i also think um we need more ways to engage with people um just more opportunities we need more protections for people i think that we the way our protected classes are situated right now we leave so many people out mm -hmm. um i just finished about an hour ago um doing a comprehensive state state by state um, analysis of protected classes mm -hmm. and some places have in the upper 20s mm -hmm. and technically we have four mm -hmm. um, and so I think that we need to be a little bit more inclusive in who we consider as um, part of a marginalized group that needs protection from discrimination so that's something that I think should happen soon. So in terms of up in the profile, appearing on this program, understand that this will go out to a number of viewers <laughs> so we've up, been able to up the profile then. But in terms of, of where, you know, where you need public's help mm -hmm. to help push and think, you know, people who are listening are citizens of the community, they're citizens of the state. Um, how can they be helpful in terms of pushing uh, uh, the legislative agenda for the commission? Um, I think not to sound like uh, every person that goes on any show, but to say, right, uh, reach out to your elected officials um, and let them know um, this is a budget year coming up and our budget is important and definitely doesn't need to be cut anymore, but def also needs to be increased. And so letting your elected officials know that this is a, something that's important to you uh, is very helpful to us because right now, especially with the growth of some of the challenges that we see, um, identifying to elected officials that this is a cause that's worth supporting and that people actually believe in is something that would be really helpful for us in the budget making process. So we're getting close to being at the end of this. So once you remind our audience again how they can get in contact with you, how they can make a complaint uh, and that process, or, you sure. know, give them the information. So again, they can call. Um, we have two numbers. We have the local number, it's 502-595-4024. And you can call the 1-800 number, which is 1-800-292-5566. Or the easier way is to go online at kchr.ky.gov. You can also send an email to kchr 
dot email <laughs> at ky dot gov, um, which also would start the process because we would then follow up and fill out the complaint for you. And then you can always stop by at three twenty two or three thirty two West Broadway, uh, the corner of Fourth and Broadway in the Hayburn Building, on the fourteenth floor. Okay, uh, I'd really like to say thank you, Terrence, for being with us, to sharing information about the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights. I think a lot of folks in our state know, who, have heard of it, uh, but don't really know how to get, engage it with the body to be able to get some things done. And hopefully with what you've shared today will be very meaningful and valuable in terms of those folks in the community. You know, this program, which is Lift Every Voice, a program of the Louisville Branch NAACP, is all about making you aware of the thing, of the organizations and processes that exist to help to protect all of your civil rights and your human rights. And we are doing that every day. If in fact you have had a situation where you've been confronted with discrimination, you now have the information on how to contact the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights. The Kentucky Commission has a statewide mission and so it can in fact uh, do work in any county, any, any area of the state and so we want you to be involved. The NAACP is an organization fighting every day for civil rights and collectively working together, we can make real difference and real changes and bring about major improvements in terms of people, environment, and where we are. And when we all work together, we're able to lift every voice. And when we lift every voice, we can make real change. Thank you.